Well, good morning. How's everybody doing? A little different day than yesterday, huh? <laughs> I'm out grilling on my back porch, grilling some burgers. It's 67 degrees. Life is great. When I get up this morning, it's 25 degrees. <clears throat> Why do we live here? We live here because of each other, right? We, we got each other here. So um, I, uh, I was going to tell you something. Oh, that's what it was. Uh, just a, a, a quick reminder. So a couple weeks ago, we took the, uh, the vote for disaffiliation a, as a church. And so that we told you at that time that was kind of step one. Step two in that process is... Uh, raising the funds we need uh, for the conference uh, before uh, their vote on us in June. So I uh, just wanted you to know that uh, we're receiving those donations towards that fund now, and if you want to contribute, um, we have a, a piece of paper that you can fill out to help us with the donations, or uh, just um, send in a check to the office, uh, leave your donation today. Um, I think we're going to have something online if it's not already there. Uh, but anyway, we just want to encourage you that that, has be that process has begun, and we encourage you to donate towards the funds needed for that, uh, for that purpose. Let's, uh, uh, hey, I haven't even said Happy Palm Sunday. <laughs> I, I keep dropping my palm, but, but anyway, it's Palm Sunday, and so you're going to hear the story of Palm Sunday from the Gospel of Mark. I'm going to share uh, Mark 11, verses 1 through 10. As Jesus and his disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the towns of Bethpage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them on ahead. Go into that village over there, he told them. As soon as you enter it, you will see a young donkey tied there that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks, what are you doing? Just say, the Lord needs it and will return it soon. The two disciples left and found the colt standing in the street, tied outside the front door. As they were untying it, some bystanders demanded, What are you doing untying that colt? They said what Jesus had told them to say, and they were permitted to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments over it, and he sat on it. Many in the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others spread leafy branches they had cut in the fields. Jesus was in the center of the procession, and the people all around him were shouting, Praise God, blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessings on the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Praise God in highest heaven. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to, to worship today on this Palm Sunday, mindful of the joy and celebration of that event 2,000 years ago, but also mindful of of the days that followed, that led to your arrest and death. But then, a week later, your resurrection. Lord, may these events that most of us are, are so familiar with speak to our hearts and minds anew today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, um, talk about your March madness but enough about Donald Trump. Um, I, <laughs> I don't know. I, I tried it. Um, I do want to talk about an ex-president, though. The ex-president I want to talk about is Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson. Um, uh, he was president when Ruth Hilfiger was born. So if you know how old she is, that'll place you. Woodrow Wilson. Uh, Gene Smith uh, was a noted, uh, is a, a noted American historian. He wrote a book in the early 1970s called When the Cheering Stopped. The book is the story of Woodrow Wilson in the final years of his presidency, including and leading up to uh, World War I. When the war was over, Wilson was an international hero. There was this great spirit of optimism, not only in America, but around the world, and people actually believed that the last world war had been fought. They actually believed that the world had indeed been made safe for democracy. Now, here's how popular Wilson was. He went to Paris 
uh, and on his first visit to Paris after the war, he was greeted by cheering mobs. In fact, it was said that he was more popular than their own French war heroes, uh, which is not an oxymoron, apparently. Um, I can say that I'm French. Um, the, the same thing was true in England and Italy. In fact, it, there was a story going around at the time from a, a hospital in Vienna that the Red Cross workers there had told the children that there would be no Christmas presents because of the war. But the children didn't believe it because President Wilson was coming to Europe, and so surely there'd be presents. That optimism and cheering lasted about a year, and then it gradually began to slow down and eventually stop. It turned out that the political leaders in Europe were much more concerned with their own agendas than they were with having peace throughout the world. Back at home, Woodrow Wilson ran into opposition in the United States Senate as his League of Nations, the forerunner to the United Nations, was not ratified. So think about this for a second. Wilson, at the height of being a hero, is, is creating and forming this League of Nations and then uh, his popularity declined so quickly that when the League of Nations is actually formed, the United States doesn't even become a member. That's how bad things were for President Wilson. Under the strain of it all, the president's health began to suffer. And in the next election, he and his party were defeated. And so it was a that Woodrow Wilson, a man who barely a year or two earlier had been heralded as some kind of new world Messiah, came to the end of his days a broken and defeated man. It is a sad story, but not an unfamiliar one. Some might say that Jesus went through a similar fall from hero to broken, and Jesus did it in just a matter of a few days. So let's start with the part of the story where they hail him as a hero. Today is Palm Sunday, as I've already mentioned, and Jesus is hailed as a hero on Palm Sunday. This is the day that marks Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. This was the last stage in his journey. It was an act of courage. All of his life was leading up to this final week. You'll find the event recorded in all four Gospels, meaning it's significant. And we heard Mark's version just a moment ago. Mark 11 begins, and Jesus and his disciples approached Jerusalem. And, and a crowd begins uh, to form. This is something that Jesus and the disciples are, are getting used to. It, it, it's, this crowd really kind of uh, creates this spontaneous parade as Jesus came towards the city, leafy palm branches were spread before him, and there were shouts of Hosanna. So you received the leafy palm branches as you entered today. The shouts of Hosanna basically means uh, uh, save us now. Um, we, don't, we, we often think of that word as some sort of praise to Jesus, but really the save us now indicates that it was more of a cry out to God and, and maybe a cry out to Jesus as God. All of this is especially noteworthy to the Jew, Jewish audience of the day because in uh, Zechariah 9.9, uh, 9, uh, it says, Rejoice, O people of Zion. The, these words are coming to life right before their very eyes. Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. Okay, so mention the donkey here. What is the significance of this donkey? Well, it's more than just part of the fulfillment of that prophecy. First of all, we have to remember that the donkey was a more noble animal back in those days. Often a king would ride on a donkey. But when he did so, uh, it was the sign that the king was coming in peace, not in war. If he was coming in war, he might ride on a horse. But a donkey was a symbol of peace. Today, we, well, we generally don't consider the donkey a very noble animal, do we? Uh, in fact, I looked this up. I was trying to find out how many schools in our country have donkey as their mascot. Uh, there's one. There are, are no colleges, zero colleges. There's one high school 
that has the donkey as the mascot. It's in Bray, Oklahoma. That's right, Bray, Oklahoma. You can check it out. <laughs> so the donkey's not so popular, but um, in Bray, Oklahoma, Shrek would be proud. So um, Matthew tells us that the donkey, this particular donkey, has never been written before. Mark mentions it as well. Th this would make it eligible for sacred purposes. Just like the Ark of the Covenant uh, had been carried by a cart that had never been used before, Jesus now enters the city on a donkey that had never been ridden before. For the Jewish audience there too, this, this uh, procession would have also been reminiscent of something that happened 150 years earlier when Simon Maccabees uh, returned from a military victory. All of this points to, to, to something else that was going on here that I think Mark wants us to see. In Mark 11.2, it says, As soon as you enter, Jesus talking to his disciples, as soon as you enter the town, you will see a young donkey tied there that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. So Jesus is sending his disciples into the town to get a, a donkey. And, and it seems to be a premeditated act. Jesus was not a procrastinator. Now, we know that Jesus has friends in the area, including Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. We also know uh, that he made regular visits to Jerusalem, primarily for the Jewish holy feasts. So it would be... No accident, uh, he, he would know people, he would know the, the area, and, and so uh, he gives his disciples maybe some password or some code word uh, when they go to pick up this donkey, and they're there to say, the Lord needs it. So, allow me to potentially spoil a future episode of The Chosen. We've, many of us have been watching this film project and have completed all the way through the three seasons that are available. In season three, episode three, The Chosen creates a, a, a story where there's a bridal that is important to Jesus and his ministry. It was, they, they say in, this, in the, their imagined story that, that Joseph has given, uh, Jesus' father Joseph has given him this bridal that's been passed down through generations. And then at the end of that episode, Jesus gives that bridal to Lazarus and tells him to hang on to it for him until he needs it again. So could it be that in a future episode, we'll see Jesus going to Lazarus for that bridal that has already been given the symbol of deliverance, for that bridal to be used on the donkey that's used on Palm Sunday? We shall see. I am pretty confident in my prediction anyway. <laughs> Palm Sunday got its name from the palm branches. The Gospel of John records that detail, that the leafy branches were from the palm trees. Um, and, and essentially what's happening here is they are giving Jesus this royal treatment. Jesus rides into his capital city as a conquering king and is hailed by the people as such. Mark 11, 8 says, Many in the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others spread leafy branches they had cut in the fields. King Jehu was honored the same way at his coronation. There's something about saying Jesus is king going on here. Jesus' purpose in riding into Jerusalem was to make a deliberate and dramatic claim to be their Messiah. But Jesus' purpose was not the kingship of a throne, but rather the kingship of the heart. And the week ahead would show that most of the people along this parade route just don't understand his real purpose. Jesus had come, Jesus had become a, a threat to the established powers in Jerusalem, both the religious powers and the political powers. But the kingdom of God was not a political concept. And by the end of the week, Jesus will have highlighted the reality of uh, that what they wanted was not what they needed. Palm Sunday can never be fully understood outside of the context of Holy Week. Now, I don't want to rain on this parade, but Palm Sunday is the prelude to Christ's crucifixion and death. See, the cheering did not last for long. 
Sometime during that very week, just over the next few days, the tide begins to turn against him. His critics begin to publicly attack him, something that was not so common before this week. His enemies begin to perceive that the fickle public is turning on him. And when they discovered that they could not discredit Jesus for his moral character, they began to take more desperate measures. And so what you have is these greedy money men and these merciless tax collectors and these evil religious leaders and these corrupt politicians all coming together to conspire against Jesus and it's a recipe for disaster. Before it was all over, they would bring Jesus to his knees under the weight of a cross. So how did we go from Hosanna on Sunday to the, the, the shouts of crucify him on Friday. How did we go from the palm branches to the olive branches? The palm branches that are waving in praise to God on Sunday to the olive branches that surround Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane where he is arrested. Just five days. It all fell apart. Why did the cheering Stop. Well, some people will look to one event. They'll look to the event during that week on Tuesday when Jesus overturned the tables of the money changers in the temple. And they'll say, well, that was it. That was the day that everybody turned on him. But if that's so, why didn't they arrest him on Tuesday? It may have played a part. I think it has a lot more to do with the threat that Jesus was to the established powers that be, both the religious powers and the political powers there in Jerusalem. And the fact that the public began to realize their misunderstanding of what Palm Sunday really was. Remember the kind of Messiah that the Jews were looking for? They wanted someone to overthrow the Roman government. They were looking for a leader of a revolution. They wanted a king of the Jews. But Jesus kept talking about these specifics and things that just did not add up to their view of what a Messiah should be. And they certainly weren't looking for a martyr. They were not looking for somebody to die for his beliefs. During Holy Week, Jesus showed them who he really was and why he really came. And many did not want to accept it. And regardless of the opinions of the people at those in that week, the, those eight days still changed the world for all time. They even had an impact on eternity. I think it's significant that John records a scene in heaven with Jesus on the throne that features palm branches during this eternal celebration of our risen Lord. If you just look in Revelation chapter 7, uh, verse 9 for this picture, you'll see Uh, It says, after this, I saw a vast crowd, too great to count, from every nation and tribe and people and language, standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes and held palm branches in their hands. Hmm. And then these palm-bearing saints begin to shout, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. It's a beautiful picture. But Jesus still has one important responsibility before getting to that throne in heaven. After Palm Sunday, the road leads to the cross. On Friday of that week, following betrayal, arrest, imprisonment, desertion, false trials, denial, crucifixion, condemnation, beatings, sentencing, Jesus carried his own cross to Golgotha, the place of the skull, where he was crucified with two other prisoners. Now, Christians around the world know the crucifixion as the passion of the Christ. It's called the passion because there is no greater love than what Jesus did for us. Ultimately, in our culture, though, the emotion, the pain, the passion of the crucifixion is often lost in the distractions of our world. But let's today take a moment and think about the cross. The cross is such a contradiction 
It is both a thing of beauty and at the same time the ugliest instrument of death ever created. We look at the cross and we see both torture and triumph, both passion and pain, all in one. The the cross is repulsive and yet it can fill us with hope. The Apostle Paul remarked on this when he wrote to the church in Corinth. He said, the message of the cross, cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction, but we who are being saved know it is the very power of God. The cross is so important. It is not just an incredible demonstration of sacrificial love, but it but it also reminds us that Jesus walks with us through all of the trials of our lives. James Denny, a Scottish theologian, once said that as a Protestant, he envied the Catholic priest and the, who, who owned the crucifix. The crucifix is the cross with the physical body of Jesus on it. And James Denny said, I, I would like to go into every church across the land and hold up the crucifix and cry to the congregation, God loves like that. No, we cannot separate the Palm Sunday from the the week that follows it. Because the cheers eventually lead to the cross. And the cross is where God demonstrated his sacrificial love for us. So how do we respond to Palm Sunday and the cross? Well, I want to suggest that we combine the excitement of Palm Sunday with the understanding of the cross and that we worship God from that place with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. If Jesus has made a triumphal entry into our hearts, well, then that means that he reigns there with peace and love. So as his followers, we must display those same qualities of peace and love to a hurting and needy world that is looking for a Savior and shouting out in their own way, Hosanna, save us now. It's our job to bring the good news of the cross to a seeking world.